Welcome everyone. Uh, today is February 26, 2020. And today is our evidence-based coaching professional series webinar on coaching women leaders. And we're excited to have a panel of uh, uh, fielding alumni uh, who have been through either coaching program or, or uh, advanced uh, education PhD program. Uh, and they will be talking about their experiences in working with women as uh, leaders and coaching them uh, to increase their leadership effectiveness. Uh, I'm gonna briefly introduce, introduce uh, the panelists uh, and then ask them to say a little bit more about themselves when we begin the first question. Uh, so we have today uh, Joan Flora. Uh, she is the Director of Clinical Practices at the University of Portland. Uh, and we have uh, Carol gillis Nesland. Uh, she is the principal. She has her own consulting firm, uh, Business Leadership Institute. Uh, and is, also has a rich corporate career and, and previously. We have Melanie Payne Polk, uh, who is also has her own consulting firm. Uh, Melanie is with the principal at Bright House Marketing and Coaching and uh, is also a fielding uh, alumni. So we're really excited to have all of you here and uh, we're, we welcome you and, and uh, the panel. And I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off uh, in, uh, with the first question. And as a way of introduction, um, tell us about your journey of coaching women leaders. So why don't we start with Joan? All right, thank you. First of all, thanks for um, inviting me and having me here. My um, work in coaching began probably in 2005 as an educational leader and as an instructional coach. It was not specifically women at that time. It was anyone who was willing to um, look at their practice as teachers and to improve it, um, grow it, understand it, move on to whatever phase they want it. My work with women really very much began um, in fielding when I got very serious about coaching and what that looked like. And I, I do it almost exclusively now from University of Portland, and I'm still working in education. I'm with the School of Education, and I work with um, female educational leaders. So um, thrilled to be in the position where I can help support their good work as leaders. Great, thank you, Joan. Let's hear from Carol. Uh, so I would classify myself as uh, maybe a recovering female executive. <laughs> um, so I had, as Terry mentioned, um, I've had a long background in high tech and clean tech, uh, leading teams largely on the revenue generation side of the house. So, you know, think about sales and marketing and that sort of thing. And um, through my career, I always found great benefit in mentors and coaches, uh, professional leadership development programs and that sort of thing. And I always found that those were very helpful to me in learning to be a more effective leader, uh, both in terms of my leadership skills with the team and also in terms of being able to execute from a business perspective. Um, as I moved further into my career, I found that uh, a lot of uh, newer or younger executives, with particularly female executives, would come to me and um, ask for coaching and advice and that sort of thing. So as I thought about um, my move, which I characterize as going from being in charge to helping the people who are in charge, I decided that coaching would be of a, a particular interest to me because I really do want to help people be more effective leaders. And I think just because I had a career where I was successful in a largely male dominated industries, both high tech and clean tech tend to be uh, very male oriented. Um, I seem to have attracted a large number of female clients, both early career um, leaders as well as more seasoned leaders. So that's kind of how I, I found myself in this practice. And someone asked me, you know, do you prefer coaching men or women? I would say I don't necessarily have a preference. I think that um, what I like is people who are interested in growing and learning. And just I think at this point, I find myself with a lot of female clients largely because of my background. Mm -hmm. So, Excellent. Thank you, Carol. And Melanie. 
Hello, everybody. Um, so my background is I come from um, the uh, a long background in marketing. Um, I had a, a marketing background and worked in um, consumer products in the beverage business and ended my corporate career at Disney. And I think it's interesting having uh, seen the Me Too movement over the last couple of years. I think of some of my early jobs especially working in very male-dominated um, fields, especially in the beverage business, working with bottlers, et cetera. It's been a lot of information and, and learning that I've been able to utilize in terms of how you know, women uh, are treated differently by uh, men in certain male-dominated fields. Um, I also, though, was coached when I was at Disney, and it was kind of at a crossroads in terms of my professional and personal life. I was starting to... Um, you know, have a family. I had, um, you know, reached a, a level at, at Disney and knew that if I was going to stay there, it was going to necessitate, you know, a certain level of, um, you know, travel and time away from my family. And so worked with a coach to kind of have the courage to basically leave the nest of Disney and the safety to launch my own consultancy, which has been fantastic. So it's, it's really yielded a lot of um, opportunities to, to really I don't want to say have it all because I don't think you can have it all. Um, you know, the my corporate uh, female leader friends have have their their all. My female friends who are full time moms have that, and I'm sort of in in between. And they all have their pluses and minuses. But I think it's what works for you at the time. So I have then therefore attracted a lot of um, coaching clients who I think are struggling with some of those um, you know balance issues of being a, a female in the workplace. Excellent. Well, thank you, Melanie. And we'll talk more about that soon. Yeah. Some of the challenges that uh, certainly show up again and again when, when coaching uh, women leaders. So how is coaching women leaders different than coaching male leaders? And let's, let's start with Melanie, because you kind of already kicked that off for us a little bit. Um, well, I, you know, it's interesting because the we, we want to think that, you know, women leaders show up and they have their experience and men, men leaders have their experience too. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, there is a different expectation, um, I think, in terms of how women show up. So the, the expectation a lot of times is that they're going to be very collaborative and that they're going to be um, very good listeners. And sometimes when they don't necessarily show up that way, they may not be perceived as likable or you know, may not be um, perceived as particularly effective. And so you know, working with them to really bring their authentic self to the workplace, I think, is, is a challenge. Um, how does that show up in a way that's going to be powerful for them but also accepted um, in the organization, the culture that they work in. So I find that that, you know, is, uh, is definitely very different than the male leaders. I will also say, and we can get that into that more later too, the whole work-life balance issue is something that seems to continually, you know, raise its head with women leaders as well as they continue to try to juggle family and work, et cetera, demands. Absolutely. Uh, Carol, what are your thoughts on how coaching women leaders differ than coaching male leaders? So as I was as I was thinking about this question, um, the phrase "it depends" comes to mind um, because I find that um, different people show up very differently uh, based on you know where they are developmentally uh, in their own path and where they are in their career. But um, adding kind of on to what Melanie was saying, I, I find um, that the way they show up in a coaching session. Uh, so maybe not so much the challenges that they're facing is uh, I find that um, younger leaders and maybe younger generations, uh, when they show up in a coaching session, they're very process story relationship oriented. So there's a lot of telling of the story mm -hmm. and a lot of wanting to talk about what's happening with the relationships and that sort of thing. Um, and it, the older women that I coach, so the, you know, think maybe Gen X and baby boomers, um, they have adopted a persona that's all about results and a, a much more what we think of as a masculine style. So I see these two things um, showing up in, uh, in female leaders at different points in their lives and their careers. And um, how that seems to be different from men is the male coach coaching clients I've had are very like, they're very results oriented. 
I've been told I have a problem I need to fix, or um, I'm trying to solve this strategy problem. Whereas the female clients I have come in and they, there's a lot more focus on talking about the story and the relationships and what's happening. And then the other thing um, that's interesting is uh, uh, awareness, I guess. Um, with female clients, they're very situationally aware of what's happening around them from a relationship perspective and how people are working with each other and what the challenges and issues are. Sometimes they're not always aware of the gender traps they might be experiencing or falling into in the organization, depending on um, on their career stage and their lived experience in that regard. Whereas uh, with a lot of my male clients, I spend a lot of time working with them on gaining awareness. So those would be two things that kind of strike me differently about my um, female and male leader clients. Great. Thank you for that. Joan, we'd love to hear your perspective. <laughs> well, I really love what um, Melanie and Carol had to share. I think the likability thing that um, Melanie brought up is certainly something that I work with with my female um, educational leaders. It's actually kind of beyond likability. Um, you know, the double standard of when women hold the line, when they have accountable conversations, they're not only are they not likable, they're, they're called bitches. Um, and so it really escalates and changes quickly. Um, I appreciate too what Carol had to say. The, the narratives that women tell are very different um, than, than the way I coach men. Some men do, of course, have narratives. But many of the women that I work with have narratives that they're sharing. And um, we just, they tend to be negative narratives. Um, they tend to be um, narratives that are based on one or two pieces of evidence. And yet, now they're generalized. Um, so women wonder, is this the right place for me? Do I belong? Um, am I good enough? Am I an imposter? And then we have all of the stereotypes that help back that up. Um, just, I was Googling, I, I do a lot with neuroeducation at University of Portland. So just Googling the different books that are available, you know, the male brain versus the female brain, you know, all, all those popular myths out there that we, um, if we're not careful, we'll believe. And if we're not really careful, we'll form a narrative around. So a lot of my coaching is calling attention to that awareness and changing the narrative. Interesting. Thank you. Um, one thing that has come up for me, because um, I do coach about 50% women, 50% men in most um, organizations, and there's this um, great research study that was done on grit and grace uh, by is Sheila Hajai um, and her co her uh, colleague. And they found that women either have a more gritty uh, style or a more graceful style, and both can be effective. But um, women have a very much more narrow uh, uh, window that they can play in without being labeled uh, or negatively uh, criticized, uh, especially when it comes to the grit grit style so i'm hearing that theme come out with within this conversation already but i'd love to hear i see you nodding your head uh, melanie about that any thoughts about this grit versus grace approach and, and how you might uh, you know recommend uh, your uh, coaching clients who are women kind of navigate that that narrow window that they can sometimes uh, stay with them without being overly criticized by their colleagues. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I find that a lot of my female clients are almost seems to be a, um, for lack of a better uh, word, like an overcorrection mm -hmm. in that it, in some places for them to feel like they have to be successful, they have to overcompensate in terms of the directive and the, you know, the don't show any kind of softness or, um, you know, kind of have this hard candy shell, if you will, around them. And what happens is there's, there's an incongruence between who they really are and how they're showing up. And there's just like a sense of what you're saying doesn't fit with the presence that you have. So 
Um, I find that trying to strip that into something that feels appropriate for them as an executive is, is a lot of the work we do, mm. you know, um, because there is, but there is that very narrow lane where they can show some vulnerability, but also be effective and, you know, make decisions and um, lead, lead their teams. But then on the other side of it, I also find there's a lot of women, and a lot, maybe on the younger side, and I also, you know, do, do some coaching, as you know, at Rice with college students too, with women, is sort of showing up small, mm. um, especially, you know, on leadership teams. Uh, yeah. Lower tone of voice, right? You know, that the somatic presence tends to be a little bit more small. So I think it's trying to figure out how you do you know, get over maybe some of those cultural issues about, you know, staying in the background and, and being larger so that you can be seen as more effective. So mm. it's kind of over, over correction either way in trying to find that balance. Yeah, interesting challenge. Joan, Carol, any thoughts about this? Uh, my lived experience <laughs> is that, um, that there is, there is perhaps, I haven't fully read the book, but that there is perhaps a narrower lane. But I also think that um, frequently female leaders, or at least it's my experience, are less willing to experiment and develop flexibility around it. There's this big fear of, well, what if I do something and the B word does come at me? Uh, is my career going to be over? Or... Um, understanding that there are times to, to employ a different strategy. And that's one of the things that I think is so great about coaching um, with a, as an opportunity for executive uh, leaders is that they can actually practice that a little bit, um, try it out, understand that there is some flexibility and take baby steps to lean into those kind of uncomfortable behaviors um, and so that they can experiment it. To me, the opportunity of, of having coaching is to be able to develop flexibility so that um, you're exercising all the tools that you, you have in your kit. And what Melanie was saying about um, younger leaders, the, the younger women that I work with is, um, it's, it's this weird kind of awareness that it's almost an awareness gap for some of them. They don't realize that they're doing it. And it's, it's easy, um, and uh, the older women, female executives that I work with, they almost over-rotate on that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's this whole idea of learning to be flexible. Um, so, and one of the things that's been really helpful for me and um, everybody who's on the call who has had any experience with me in classes at Fielding is I think the adult development framework is a really interesting way to look mm -hmm. at this whole conundrum because if you're in a place where you're getting most of your uh, your satisfaction and the goals and decisions that you're making from the environment that you're in versus from internally, uh, you're going to be responding very differently. So I think that this is also why it's different with women in different stages of their lives and their mm -hmm. careers. So mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely, Great like I care a whole lot less now about whether or not people quote unquote like me than I did when I was 35. So. Sure. Or call me the B word. Right. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna call me the B word, give me a score, and I better <laughs> score high. I'll compete with you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's great. Uh, one, jo jo one, one tendency that I've seen too is the the fallacy that women have to go it alone. You know that they that they can't work um, in collaboration or through facilitation. That they, they think that they have so much grit, <laughs> you know, like, like impossible grit. Um, not only do they do it all, um, then they probably go home and, and, you know, handle the child care and the groceries and, and everything else. It's this over-reliance on grit um, that is so, such a trap. It's not a way to, to be happy. It's not a way to sustain a career. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. So we touched on this question already, but love to hear other uh, ideas about what unique issues can come up when coaching women leaders. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll give one. I mean, and I'd love to hear other thoughts on this one. It's really interesting. There is research out there that women judge other women mm -hmm. leaders 
quite harshly. Actually, there's research that backs that up. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder with the zeitgeist of what's happening in the culture right now with, you know, what's happening about women understanding that there's such a dearth of leadership, et cetera, that if that may be shifting. But I have found that um, a lot of times the, uh, the conflict resolution and those kind of things tend to be women versus women or women um, ha having to work with other women and, and navigate some of that. It's not, not exclusively, but um, I find that to happen a lot and it's very discouraging, but I'm wondering if that's gonna be changing here. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Pat Heim has a great book on this called, um, um, uh, now I'm forgetting the name of it, but it, it's about women working together in the company of women. That's the title of the book. Uh, I use that one a lot uh, in coaching. But I, I agree with you. Some of the younger folks have uh, don't agree with everything that's in the book these days. So I think there is a shift happening uh, mm -hmm. to uh, see things slightly differently. Uh, mainly due to gender norms uh, changing is, is okay. my theory around that. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this question of, uh, you know, what unique issues can come up? When I was thinking about uh, unique issues that come up in coaching, I was, there's the issues that women present, but then there's also um, the way we show up as coaches for women. Um, and I have a couple of observations there. One is um, that I, and this is from my own experience being coached and also being a coach, is that um, it's easy for a woman coaching a woman to over identify with the challenges of being female in the workplace and to spend too much time on that story and focusing on that and maybe not focusing on the action and the, the movement because that's a, a stereotype or a bias that you hold in your own head as a coach. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I experienced lots of HR professionals and uh, executive coaches who were very dismissive that it was any different for women in the workplace at all. Um, and so I think you get this, this uh, if you're not careful and not self-aware when you're coaching, you can go to one extreme or the other where you are either over identifying with and focused on the challenges that the woman faces or not um, giving them any credence at all instead of hearing what they have to say and then being a catalyst for growth and for movement. So um, that's one of the issues that, that I know comes up for me. And the way that I uh, experience this when I'm coaching, particularly with my younger clients, is I know that I'm in the over-identifying space when I feel the sting behind my eyes. It's not like uh, it's not like <laughs> tears, but it's that precursor where someone is talking about something horrible that's happening to them or a situation, and I realize that I am spending too much time over-empathizing with the story and reliving my own story, um, and that I need to, you know take a deep breath and remember this is about them. And yes, this is the situation that they're in and I'm here to catalyze growth, not to just empathize and kind of dig into the story. So it happens for me. Um, and I don't, I can't think of one time I have ever experienced that with a male client where I suddenly was like, Oh my God, inside, like I've lived your story. Mm. Um, so it's just, it's interesting. Excellent. Thank you for bringing up, bringing up that challenge. Yeah. Joan. I, well, I have to agree. Um, getting invited into drama like that is, it, I don't know how many times a day I, I say yes to drama, but um, I'm, I'm getting better. Um, you're absolutely right, Carol. I, I absolutely agree. I do know that when I step back and when I help my clients step back and look at our work as if it were a relationship, that that, because it is, um, and that does help, you know, is, and sometimes, um, you know, I work with women who are perhaps being bullied, you know, that that's not an unheard of thing. And uh, just looking at it, if this were a personal relationship, what would your response be? You know, where, how would you handle it? Versus, um, how are they showing up? You know, are they over relying on grit? Are they over relying on leadership models that really are not 
truly their own yet? And, you know, how, how can they pivot from that? So that, that's, that's probably the most unique thing that I'm encountering right now. Thank you. Can I bring up actually one other thing really quickly? Absolutely. We touched on it a little bit, but I, I just wanted to highlight the, the for the younger and mid-level leaders, especially the, the whole work-life balance does definitely still come up a lot. I think understandably so. So I think, you know, women do tend to, I find in general, very broad brush, but bring their whole selves to the coaching. And I do coach in the, you know, the organizational space. Um, so they will look at things more holistically, even if they're working on an organizational or leadership issue uh, versus men. I recently had a, um, a male client last week who's at a company and he's thinking of going into a very entrepreneurial direction, um, which would impact earning ability and all this other stuff with two kids in college. And I asked just a very simple question, what, you know, what, have you talked to your wife or what does your wife think? And he just looked like, oh my gosh, I haven't even, you know, this is not even a part of this, this decision because he thinks of things so much into the professional lens and it really opened up another conversation, but which was really great. But again, I think they're able to compartmentalize in general. That's not always the case. Um, women, I think, will bring more of their, their whole selves to an issue. Right. Yeah. In, you know, can I, I just would like to add to that because the one thing I do, I see that men doing more is kind of negotiating better at home than women do. And what I mean by that um, is if there's going to be a job change or a shift in responsibilities, a promotion of somehow, um, my male clients tend to be able, they've already had those conversations at home. Um, like, so will you be the point of contact for emergency for the children or, you know, um, what services are we now going to enlist because we're both busy um, professionals and, and just more negotiation. I have female clients who tend to not have those pre conversations. They, they take the promotion. They're ready for it. They're amazing people. And, um, there's still the point of contact for the children. <laughs> they're still um, getting the groceries. They're, they're still doing all of these things that they didn't think to negotiate mm -hmm. at home. And that absolutely <laughs> destroys any work-life balance that you can have. And it's just, they laugh. I mean, I'm laughing because um, it's been such a common thread. It, it's just that nurturing instinct. I know that's a stereotype. Um, but it could be a useful one in this, that they don't think to pre-negotiate now that the terms have changed in, in position and employment, what does that look like at home and how can we be prepared for that? Mm. Really That's great a really point. interesting point. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask another question, uh, which is how have you seen coaching in particular uh, support the effectiveness of women leaders. Who'd like well, to kick us off? Well, I have seen that this transformational um, in, in areas where I would not have predicted the kind of growth. I mean, just the miracle of the human mind and human heart. Um, and then what happens in a culture when people are showing um, them, themselves, you know, their vulnerabilities, their true selves as people, what can begin to happen, the level of confidence that grows, the, um, just the capacity has gone beyond anything I have expected. It's gone, I mean, maybe I did that myself as, as a younger person growing into where I've gotten, but I don't know. I, I didn't know to look for it. I didn't know to market or honor it or talk about it. But what I'm seeing in female leaders now um, is huge growth, um, huge awareness, and impact. Um, what, what they're doing in the educational field for teachers, for students, for their school cultures. It's, been, it's bigger than any of us, actually. Great. Thank you, Joan. 
For, for me, I mean, I, um, where I have seen it be is, is again, I get back to that authenticity is really getting back to who they are and then where they're going to be able to show that in the workplace, because, you know, you can't turn yourself into a pretzel for too long before there's huge, you know, health issues and mental issues, et cetera. And, you know, dissatisfaction in your work life. So trying to figure out that calibration between showing up who you are, but then situationally being appropriate, you know, according to who you're working with. Um, and, you know, where are you going to be showing up best to utilize maybe more feminine types of displays of behavior and when, you know, which would be more inclusive and collaborative and when are you going to be, you know, where it would be better to show up with more masculine or more directive types of behaviors, like setting a vision, you know, being uh, strategic and planning. So figuring out that calibration, I think, has been lead, led to some really great growth and, you know, promotions and things like that once people kind of feel like they can really lean into who they are. Great. Thank you, Melanie. I think you bring up yeah. a re really good point that uh, we all, no matter what gender we are, uh, can demonstrate masculine and feminine or, mm -hmm. or, or grit and grace is, uh, I like to call it, but uh, okay. yeah, as a way to get away from the gendered uh, norms. But uh, thank you for that. Uh, Carol, you were about to say something, I think. Well, I was just going to say, I think that the beauty of coaching and how it supports women in the workplace is it gives them a place to experiment and try things on um, and to think about how they're showing up in their environment and to think out loud with somebody so that the first time that they're trying or experimenting with something isn't in an important meeting uh, that you know we can actually walk through well let's let's take a minute and what would it be like to ask your boss for such and such or to come, you know, a different behavior in a meeting that you don't think is um, on the right track and you want to move it, but instead you just sit there. What, what would that look like? What would that sound like? So that the very first time they experiment and try to develop that flexibility, it's, it's low stakes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that coaching is a great place to develop that flexibility and to think through what you want so that you can then go out and do little experiments um, and see how the little experiments work and then come back and have somebody to um, huddle with and think about, reflect on how it went. Uh, so I, I see it as being uh, transformative in that way because it gives you an opportunity, a safe learning space. Um, and I think, you know, for me personally, when I was being coached as a leader, I think one of the things that was really valuable is it was a, a sounding board. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I think of it as um, Brene Brown talks about, you know, moving from a safe space to a brave space um, where you can show up and and be authentic and yet um, be courageous in, in the work that you're doing. Yeah. yeah, powerful, powerful stuff. So one last question before we move to the audience questions, and that is, what advice do you have for others uh, wanting to develop the skills to professionally coach women leaders? You know, what might be some of the things that would help people prepare to be effective? A lot of women. <laughs> what? I said, listen to a lot of women. I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really true. I mean, it's, you know, there's, um, I would just say that, I mean, in terms of listening to, you know, our struggles and our, you know, it's real. We are not overly emotional all the time. You know, sometimes we are, but I think really just making sure that we're, we're keeping our eyes and ears open on that is, is important, you know? Wonderful. So start by listening to the women in your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Other well, recommendations? And I, think it's, I think it's useful to be, aware, particularly in, an, in a uh, company environment, to understand some of the literature and the research around issues that women face. And there are some great books out there um, about it and some of the challenges that women face in uh, business environments to understand that. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, uh, I think it's really important whether you're a woman coaching women or a man coaching women is that you really need to understand yourself and your own biases and how you think about 
the workplace and women and men and um, and work life balance and all those things because if you don't have an awareness of your own stuff, mm-hmm. um, I find that coaching women, particularly for me, I, I can um, it's really easy for me to bring my own stuff to the table and to so to be able to to really step back and be really clear about that. I I see a lot of um, consultants and coaches who are men that I've had experience with over the years who are completely dismissive of their female clients in terms of the the challenges, the very real challenges they feel in the environment. And uh, it's because it's a bias that they have. They don't see that it's an issue. It wasn't an issue for them or whatever. And it can be really damaging to the person that you're coaching. It can also be equally as damaging to over-identify with the struggles and not help somebody address the challenges. So those, those are the two things is be aware uh, of the literature and the research and also of yourself. And then the third thing I would say is, and we've touched about this a little bit, uh, there are big generational differences between the women who are assuming leadership positions now and the women who have occupied them for a period of time. And it's really important to understand uh, the mindset of the, the generational um, leader that you're coaching. So, so I just want to reiterate that. Um in the last few years I've been working with inclusion Inc and, and uh, this comes up a lot and, and I see it with women. uh, I would say the baby boomer women that were the early um, folks that, you know, kind of toughed it out in those male dominated uh, and and they, they had to be tough, right? Uh, They had to really take on some of those, what you might call male ish traits in the past. And and they will tell you this. And now the younger women, you know, the millennial women are less likely to do that. They're they're more resistant to not um, to be more themselves, right. To show up in, in the, how they lead in in the the normal life. And and it has created some conflicts that I've seen between the more senior women executives and younger women and, and, and some challenges there even. Um, and, and so it does create some interesting dialogue and diversity conversations for sure. Uh, so I, I've seen that myself. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, Carol, you're absolutely right on the self-awareness. Um, you have to, I, well, I've had to really be honed in on what's hooking me, um, what's coming to mind, how I'm showing up as a coach, as a person. And, um, you know, the questions, just that inquiry is vital in my work, even if it's something as, as simple as just repeating the last couple of words that the person has just said, um, just to get more, you know, more of the narrative, more of the story, and then some of the questioning around the assumptions in that story. So one of the, the most recent stories I've been hearing from young women right now um they're not leaders yet but but I, they will be um is when something's gone wrong when something hasn't worked out the way they thought it was going to they really especially if they come from a background of trauma or poverty they take that as evidence that something is wrong with them and will run with it so part of my work, you know, that's part of the awareness work that um, something happened, something bad happened. This is not what you wanted. This is not what you expected, but it, it is not you. It's, it's not how you're going to identify. Um, I mean, you could, but it, that's going to get in the way of the work that you really dream of doing. So, um, I, you know, it, self-awareness is, is huge. Thank yeah. you all. So I would like to um, move to the the some of the questions that have been posed already in the uh, chat room. And uh, Sandy, are, are you interested in asking your question? Uh, can you uh, unmute yourself? Yeah, this is Sandy from uh, China. So uh, we also heard we often heard about the comment that uh, female leaders are more emotional than male leaders. And actually, I think emotions is actually a kind of a resource. So I'm curious to know how you handle um, female leaders' um, emotions and try to navigate in a positive way in your coaching practice. 
Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Terry. I mean, certainly, I, I think that, you know, it's a really great question because in as a coach and as somebody who's been trained at fielding, I think one of the things is we have to be, you know, that self as coach, that work that we do on ourself, we have to understand how we feel about emotions, you know, and I, I mean, it does happen. There's some pretty deep stuff that happens. So being comfortable holding the space for the client to be able to express those emotions and clear if they need to or whatever, um, but utilizing those as, as um, understanding kind of where that is coming from as a strength and then how to utilize that in terms of, you know, figuring out their values, um, you know, to then make the change or growth that they're looking for. So, um, I, you know, I think though it is getting very comfortable for yourself to, to be able to handle that and not try to fix it. You know, to to give them the space to to express it. Joan, Carol, any thoughts on this one? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. <laughs> so, what's almost underneath that question is, you know, are women overly emotional, and does that impact their ability to lead? Uh, maybe that's not there. Um, does anyone else hear that? That that could be my uh, my getting hooked. <laughs> It certainly comes up a lot. Yeah, it it has in my work. Um, so that's one of the stereotypes that women are overly emotional, and then you know when when they are, they're not fit um, for duty, and that that's a stereotype that we really really need to be aware of and and get rid of. Um, the other thing about emotions for me, and I love what Melanie had to say, absolutely, holding space for for anything that comes up for your client. But um, just the whole idea that someone can make you feel something. You know, I, I hear it all the time, especially more out of my younger clients than out of my older clients. But um, that someone can make you angry or happy or depressed or dismissed or what whatever it is just really exploring that myth and again i i know why we think that uh you worked for pixar or um, disney melanie i mean pixar that cute adorable movie um i can't remember the name of it now the one uh, inside out oh, yeah. right mm -hmm. um how emotions are are made um you know, we've, we've got anger neurons or joy neurons or whatever it is. <laughs> and that complete nonsense about how we construct emotions. Um, that it's, it's something that is brewing within us and will come out, will get triggered or whatever. Um, so I, I don't go into a lot of the neuroscience of emotions with clients because it's not, it's not actually the work that we're doing. But I can listen to the stereotypes around emotions and help clients understand that they're actually so much more empowered than thinking something can trigger them. And I'm not talking about people who've had amazing trauma that that actually is triggering. Um, just the fact that no one can make you feel anything. We all laughed about, yeah, you know, how many times have I been called B word? A lot. Um, it's not necessarily funny to me, but it, it doesn't hook me. It doesn't impact me at all. Um, and I, I do I, think. Yeah, I, it's in, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was, um, I was I, in terms of the question though, I was taking it like when a, a, a leader gives or shows emotions in the session, I guess that's what I was mm -hmm. think, hearing. Maybe, maybe I, I misheard the question, but because I do, I will say with my female clients, I have had a lot more, you know, displays of emotions um, than I have with men. I mean, I haven't had a man ever mm -hmm. shed tears in a session um, than that I have had women. So I don't know why that is. I maybe, you know, I, again, I don't know why, but um, maybe I just feel like, you know, maybe they feel like it's a safe space for them to, for them to, you know, showcase that emotions that they can't show in the workplace. Right. Well, the way I read the question is, how do you handle women leaders' emotions in coaching? Um, so I think I think we're answering the same question. 
yeah. Um, but Carol, what do you think? I don't know that I have anything meaningful to add. I mean, I, I think um, it goes back to this whole idea of flexibility, which is what you're talking about, um, is the ability to recognize that you have flexibility around your emotions. Like the emotion might come up, but you have some flexibility in terms of how you act on it, mm -hmm. right? I might feel sad, but that doesn't mean that I have to um, show up in the way, the same way always when I'm sad. Hmm. I might catalyze that into something else or anger or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I do think women are accused of being overly emotional. And then when they're not emotional enough, that's a whole nother thing. Um, <laughs> sure. So it is an interesting tight, tight rope that they have to walk. Um, yeah. So just as a, point of interest uh, our next webinar uh, and I'll, I'll mention this at the end too on March 11th is dealing with this very subject so we're going to be hearing from a couple of uh, scholars on um, tenor the new approach to coaching clients and emotional intelligence and it'll deal with okay. a lot of a lot of things that you just mentioned Joan you know how, how where do emotions come from how can we use them more effectively and their whole uh, premise is that emotions are uh, are a point of strength and wisdom and emotions are uh, signposts to help us uh, be more effective, uh, and we should encourage them. So I think if you're interested in emotion, emotions and coaching around emotions, you'll, you'll love this webinar. So t tune in on March 11th for that. I love that. I mean, if we can think of, I, I know we don't normally, but if we can think of emotions as thinking, emotions as a form of thought, it's, it's a pretty powerful avenue. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been using that technique for about three years and found it to be amazing, actually. Um, so we have another question uh, today from Lynn Harrison. Lynn, would you uh, like to come online and ask your question? Sure. I actually had two questions, So, and I see we're getting toward the end of the hour. So maybe I'll just run with the first one. Uh, some recent research has shown that women tend to be different from male leaders in that they're worriers. Um, so they're more concerned about doing things right, not making mistakes, being conscientious. And this has contributed to their success, but can also hold them back at the executive level as they're seen as not being bold enough. I wondered if this has been your experience and, and how you work with this in coaching. I think the move from being a manager to being an executive, um, it is a different job. And, you know, there are a lot of books that have been written about it. What got you there, what got you here won't get you there, I think is one of the classic ones on it, which is that there are skills and capabilities that you have that make you good at your current job. But when you move into a job with bigger scope, you need to rethink um, how you're showing up at the table, how you're getting satisfaction from your work, what you're contributing to the company, what the expectation is. And I think that one of the great things about coaching for any executive making, any manager making that transition into the executive role, uh, particularly for women because they might not have a lot of people in the workplace that they can look to or talk to about these things, is to understand what that transition looks like and use the coaching environment to build some of those skills. So worrying might have been effective when you're leading a project that needs to be delivered on June 5th at 5 p.m., but it's not as effective when you're trying to set a strategy and you need to be the positive forward force mm -hmm. versus the force that's trying to keep the train on the tracks. And there are actually different roles and different skills. So I think um, coaching is the very environment where you can help uh, executive women moving into an executive role to do that. And if they don't transition, they won't be effective, just like the men who don't make the transition aren't effective. Likely the men have mentors or role models in the workplace that they can talk to or see making that transition where women don't have that as much. Carol, I think that's a really good point. I, again, the men that I work with tend to negotiate a mentor from the very beginning of their, <laughs> yes. of their um, you know, work. Women don't. Women, um, the women I work with don't. Um, sometimes a school will assign a mentor or create a mentor, but a lot of times women don't seem to, to consider that for themselves. Um, 
the other, let's see, what, help me with the, the prompt again. I, it slipped my mind. Her quite all worriers. Um, it is contextual, I agree. And I'm a worrier, I, I, you know, and I know, I know when it's productive worry, you know, where it's worry kind of as thought and emotion and I need to take some action. I also know that when it's me over relying on grit, doing too much on my own and not using my team, and not delegating, you know, that that's mm. my thing. Um, and I'm better at it. It tells me it's time to get going on the delegation. Um, but it's also when I realize it's just a habit, just a pattern, um, I, I realize it's time to breathe and just, just meditate and maybe just count to 10, you know, whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning or if it's in the afternoon. So, again, getting back to self-awareness, what – what I do, I don't know that every woman is is more of a warrior than than men. I, I think it's probably more of a a thinking pattern than anything that's gendered. Yeah, a lot of this I think um, goes back to personality theory, mm -hmm. and um, you know we're using the Berkman now at, at Fielding, and and these are all the scales, right? That you, they have the worry scale, they have the assertiveness mm -hmm. scale, they have the emotional scale, and and uh, the research has, has found that there really isn't uh, a gender bias uh, uh, on those uh, in, in the Berkman data, um, which is interesting. Uh, so, so I think there is a full spectrum, men and women, but there's certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, norms that show up that, 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 uh, that do, uh, we talk about sometimes regarding this. But, uh, so, it, you know, personality is an interesting uh, overlay uh, to gender. And how do how do those interrelate? I think it's really important to consider. Um, so we also have a question from Lori. Uh, Lori, would you like to come online and ask your question? Hi everyone. Um, this was really really interesting for me. Um, my situation is a little bit different in terms of why I tuned into this webinar. I'm considering getting. Uh, I've been in the entertainment industry for 15 years, and I'm considering going back to school and transitioning into another facet. Um, what I'm interested in doing is a lot what you got a lot of the things you guys are working on is which is um, being a consultant for females in the entertainment industry, coaching and sort of using my experience and a lot of the things you guys talked about, I experienced obviously firsthand. Um, I call it the flip side of victim, which is I am not that person that Harvey Weinstein is taking into that hotel room because I'm going to say, no, Harvey, that's bad. But I have had been penalized and seen a lot of career setback because I advocate and I'm strong and haven't always had the tools to handle situations that I wasn't prepared for. So hearing you guys say all this is like, it's real. I knew it was real. You know, it's really helpful. And I wish I had known about coaching when I was starting to kind of come up. But regardless, I'm super passionate about what you guys do. And I was looking at fielding. Um, I love the idea of the evidence-based coaching program, but I also was looking at the certificate in um, IO, industrial organization, like the psychology of the workplace. And I'm wondering degree-wise for making the transition, what your path was and what you think is the most helpful way to start a new career doing what you guys do, but carving a niche in my industry. And is that a good idea? And is there a career there? That's a lot of questions, but <laughs> really appreciate any insight. Well, thank you, Lori. Uh, we, we can probably hit on a couple of them, but we might need to have further one-on-one -on -one conversation later. So I, I do want to also okay. encourage you to reach out and we can talk further. But any thoughts on, on, on her situation? Because I know, Melanie, you, you kind of come from a similar background, it sounds like, right? Yes. Being, I'm like, Lori, you and I need to speak. I love that. <laughs> For sure, seriously. Um, yeah, I have I have an MBA, um, and then long you know career in marketing, consulting, and then I got my um, certification at Fielding, the um, EBC certification, and just started dabbling in the coaching while I was doing the consulting. Had to make a living, you know, and um, and then slowly got into that. And now that this is all I do, I do you know training and workshops and, and executive coaching. So, I mean, you know, that's my path. I don't have an IO or 
uh, degree or PhD or anything like that. But you know, my, my, I really was leveraging my business experience into the coaching world, working with, or, you know, in organizations, um, not only entertainment, but you know, high tech really, honestly, when you're a great coach, a good coach as we all are, you can really coach anywhere. Um, I always thought when I came in that, Oh, I'm going to coach entertainment, female entertainment executives. Well, I can do that, but you know, if you're a great coach and you have the great skills and the presence, really, you can be a great coach to to anybody. Is what I found. Great, great. Well, what were you. your thoughts, um, Joan and Carol? Just out of curiosity, I'll yeah. put in an un unabashed uh, plug for the EBC program. Um, so I started coaching and consulting before actually doing the certificate program. And what I would say is really great about going through the program is it actually helps you think about the coaching process um, and learning a process, learning a discipline and learning some, um, some of the theory um, un behind what might be happening with your client or in the organization. And so I think it's a great way to make that transition. And I would just highlight what Melanie was saying, which is, you know, experiment a little bit, dip your toe in. And, and as it goes along, you'll find out whether or not it's right for you. Consulting is right for some people. Coaching is right for some people. Um, and I think you learn by doing. Can but I just, put in a big plug for fielding. Can yeah. you just delineate consulting versus coaching? Because <laughs> I know the difference. <laughs> Like specifically, what are how, how what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know, Terry. I'm going to let you do that one, just so that I, you know. Yeah, it's it's a bigger conversation, uh, Lori. <laughs> but 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 to make it really simple, uh, coaching is really about asking questions and holding space for someone to discover uh, who they are and where they want to go and how they're going to get there. Uh, consulting is more about providing advice or expertise. So you're coming in as an expert, usually on, on consulting, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, and then with coaching, you're coming as, in as, as really uh, an expert in holding space uh, you know, for your client uh, and not necessarily telling them what to do. You, you might brainstorm with them on occasion, but you're not ever saying, well, this is, this is where you should go. Uh, so it's a it's a different model. Um, that doesn't mean that coaches don't have a lot of knowledge and expertise. Uh, it's just that they use that to inform their questions, but less about um, giving advice. Okay. So that is a, a quick answer, <laughs> but it's a much bigger debate, yes. right? And there's an ongoing debate in the coaching world is is how much advice do coaches actually give and, and what's appropriate. So that's a huge debate and probably will go on forever. <laughs> right? So uh, there obviously is uh, some overlap between consulting and coaching, especially OD consulting because mm -hmm. organizational development consulting has a lot of coaching uh, coach like processes in it uh, and vice versa. So uh, they, they have some overlap. So we are a little bit over time. So I just want to, uh, you know, in the program here. So I want to thank our panelists, uh, you know, Joan, Carol, Melanie, for sharing your wisdom and being open. Uh, a lot of these topics are very relevant right now uh, in, in the world. So I think this was timely and, and we'll, there'll be ongoing conversation, I'm sure, as we uh, continue to evolve in this space uh, around gender and men and women in the workplace and leadership. So thank you for uh, being vulnerable and sharing your own experiences and, and providing some uh, initial conversation for us around this topic. So I just want to congratulate you on all your success so far and your uh, uh, great uh, opportunity to, to share uh, your own experience. So thank you for coming. I also just also want to briefly um, let everyone know about what's coming. Uh, up in with fielding in the next uh, few uh, weeks and months. Uh, so if you have not yet joined our coaching community of practice, uh, this webinar is actually a program of the coaching community of practice, which is sponsored by fielding, but uh, is open to anyone in the world. So you don't have to be an alum. You don't have to be a student. Uh, you can join right now. So, and we encourage you to do that for free. So if you go to CCOP, Dot fielding dot edu uh, and scroll down to the bottom and click on subscribe. Uh, it will uh, I will add you to our base camp site, 
and the base camp is a place for you to learn about coaching, uh, the research that Fielding does, and our upcoming webinars. Um, we also have a blog. Uh, our blog is uh, very powerful and, and is sharing best practices and information and cutting uh, leading research in the space of coaching. And it also lists all of our upcoming webinars. So I mentioned already our next one is on March 11 uh, on Tenor. Highly recommend you uh, tune in for that. Uh, some brown, groundbreaking ideas around emotional intelligence that you will have not heard anywhere else. I can guarantee you that. Um, so it's, it's some brand new theory and practice. We also are going to have on uh, March 28th, uh, measuring uh, mindset and change readiness for coaching. So if you're a coach and want to hear uh, about a tool that will measure readiness, uh, you can hear from Jody O'Dell. Uh, she will be uh, sharing her research and methodologies with us. Uh, after that, we will also uh, have uh, Brian Underhill on April 1st. Brian is the uh, president and founder of Coach Source, which is the largest uh, network of executive coaches in the world. Uh, and I'm really excited to have him share his research on executive coaching trends. And this will include pricing. I know people always ask about pricing. So you're going to hear some hard data on what coaches can earn out in the, in the world. Um, and he also has information uh, on a little bit of life coaching information too. Uh, and then if you're interested in marketing on March 18th, um, we also have uh, Jeff Moore. He's a personal friend of mine and he'll be talking about the Book Yourself Solid system, which is a powerful way of building your coaching practice. Um, and um, I'm actually using these same techniques at Fielding. Uh, so I can guarantee you they work. Uh, if you want more clients and want great clients that you want to work with, uh, come in here, uh, Jeff Moore. I'm also certified in this process and one of the Book Yourself Solid certified coaches, so I can personally vouch for this system. And Jeff is a great presenter, so I think you'll really enjoy hearing him uh, talk about the system and how you can uh, you know, grow your client base. So tune in, uh, and uh, lots of great information coming up soon. Uh, around uh, all these different topics. So, and we do record these and post them on our public website. So if you have not yet seen uh, these posts, you can just go to coach.fielding.edu and click on either professional series videos. And uh, that's where tonight's webinar will be posted. Uh, or you can also click on thought leaders uh, series, which is more about our research in coaching. So if you're interested in research and, you know, cutting edge thoughts, um, this is where all those webinars are posted. And uh, you can watch them at your convenience uh, for no cost. So again, thank you all for coming tonight. And we hope to see you shortly in one of our other webinars. And thanks again for our panelists tonight, sharing their wisdom and, and, uh, and thought provoking questions to, you know, with all of our audience. So uh, have a good evening, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Carol. Good night. Bye for now.